on the true vine. And we are the branches. Everything attached to him wins. Amen. He said, abide in me as I abide in you, that you will bear much fruit. So long as we stay attached to him, we win. Amen. Amen. God is good. The devil is mad, but that's all right. I'll be mad too if I was the devil. Amen. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. God, we thank you that because we are attached to the Lord Jesus Christ, the true vine, we win. We thank you for the victory that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for your word, for your promise of glory. Father, you said the glory of the latter house will be far greater than that of the former. Lord, and as we unpack that today, God, I ask that you will open our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. Open our hearts to receive your word. If somebody in here is not saved, God, I will pray that you would turn their heart towards you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing in uh, the book of Ezra. Uh, we're going to look at chapters 5 and 6 today, and we're going to look at Haggai chapter 2. We're going to sneak that in there. And the title of today's message is we're going to talk about the latter house glory. Amen. By way of introduction... So just a, a summary of, of what we've discussed so far is the remnant, a remnant of Israelites, they've returned to the land. They went back to Judea from the Babylonian captivity. And they didn't come back just for the sake of returning to their homeland, but they were tasked with a mission. They were tasked with rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. They rebuilt the altar and reinstituted the scheduled ritual sacrifices. They laid the foundation for the new temple. And just when they were making progress, opposition came. So we heard about that over the last couple of weeks. Opposition. But how many people know that God will make, turn your opposition into opportunities? There's a purpose even in the opposition. We're going to look at that today. Opposition came, the people got complacent, and the work stopped. And see, I'm, I'm convinced that if the completion of God's mission was 100% up to us, it would not get done. Why? Because we're dealing with the weakness of our flesh. We're easily distracted. We got all these excuses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And just like Israel, the work would stop. If it was up to us, that's the key, if. <laughs> but see, even in this story of building a temple, something bigger was at play. Yeah. See, the, the rebuilding of the temple at that time was just another step in God's plan for the ages. See, there's always a bigger picture. God sees an eternity. Right? Sometimes we only see what's right in front of us, but God is looking way down the road. He declares the end from the beginning. And he's going to remind them about that. See, it wasn't just about a building. Buildings can come. Buildings can be torn down. Buildings can go. But God was doing something bigger. But that this, their, their role in that particular time of history was a part of God's plan for the ages. The restoration of Jerusalem had a bigger purpose than just being a homeland 
for one people group. That was a part of it. God made promises, and but he had a purpose that was beyond just one nation. This was another step in God's plan for the ages. And the question that we have to ponder, right, these things are written for our example. The things we have to ponder is, do you see God's eternal plan in the work he has given you to do? We're going to chew on that. Section one. Despise not prophesying. Call your attention to Ezra chapter 5. We're going to do a little recap to, to catch us back up to, to where we are today. Ezra chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the dynamic duo. Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophets prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with, with them, helping them. Amen. We're going we're gonna, to uh, connect that with Haggai. Just the end of Haggai chapter 1, uh, Pastor Rayfield went over this last week, but just by way of, of helping us connect this to today, uh, Haggai chapter 1, uh, verses 12 through 15 says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God in the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai the Lord's messenger spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Haggai and Zechariah provided prophetic inspiration to the people. The leaders took action. They responded to the word of God. And in this, they name three types of leaders. Prophets, they named the priest Joshua, and then they named Zerubbabel, who was, who would have been, if all things, they would have stayed obedient, he would have been the king of Israel at that time because right. he was in the line of David so right. he would have been the king right. and see the prophet the priest and the king they were the anointed leaders in the Old Testament right. in Old Testament Israel you had the prophet the priest and the kings those were the three anointed leaders and that word anointed is the Hebrew word Messiah so they were all representing a type of Messiah and Christ fulfilled all three of those roles perfectly. Zerubbabel represented the royal line of Judah. He is listed in the genealogy of Christ and would have been king. So then just by way of, 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 uh, of reminder for some and uh, uh, new information for others maybe, what is the role of the prophets, right? The prophets is not just about telling the future. Even though we do, uh, God does reveal some things about the future through prophets, but that is not their only or primary role, right? We call the future uh, information, we call that foretelling, right? They're telling something to come, but then their primary, most of the prophetic messages we have recorded in the Bible are what we would call foretelling. And that can, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 3 kind of gives us a hint at what that uh, role of the prophetic ministry is, where Paul says, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation 
and comfort to men. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. The word edification, this may be a typo, uh, not, on, not on your handout, but the word edification, uh, well, in the English is where we get the word edifice, right? People say this edifice. You see that word edification in there. Well, the Greek word translated edification is a construction term. So it's related to building people up. See, it is the word of God that builds us up. The word of God builds us up into what God wants us to be. As the word of God builds you up, then you can use the word of God to build others up. Edification. Say that again. It is the word of God that builds you up. And as the word of God builds you up, then you can use the word of God to build others up. If you want to, you can say it again. <laughs> and so we have to be careful. That's why Peter says, speak as though speaking the oracles of God. We should be speaking life, grace, peace, speaking into each other's lives, calling us into the deeper life in Christ, building us each other up in Christ, not chewing on each other and tearing each other down. And I'm going to tell you how it is and what you should and all of that, because words can do damage. We used to say sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That's not true. Or God wouldn't say, you know, don't speak certain things. He say, bless and do not curse. Let filth, don't let filthy communication uh, proceed out of your mouth. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. The word of God, edification, exhortation, and comfort. Not just telling people, I see money in your future. <laughs> I see 10 businesses. It's all over you. It's all over you. We need more prophecy in the church. We need more building each other up in the word of God. Amen. Section two. So. Haggai prophesies to the people, their spirits are stirred up, and they get to work. And so now we're going to get a little sneak peek of, of what was Haggai saying to the people during this time. Amen? So Haggai is a very short book. It's only two chapters. Amen? <laughs> it's two chapters. You can read a whole book of the Bible in, you know, maybe about 10 minutes. So depending on how fast you read. But Haggai chapter 2 kind of gives us a clue. Um, he dates his messages so this uh, message in Haggai chapter 2 takes place just about 30 days after uh, uh, chapter 1, where it says they started uh, building the house of God, right, or rebuilding it. So what we're going to see is three prophetic messages and two considerations. Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. All right, I'm going to stop right there. So message number one. About 30 days after the rebuilding began, Haggai has a message for the people. Yes. Now he's referring back to the end of Ezra 3 where it says they laid the foundation and some of the older people who saw Solomon's temple were crying because they were disappointed God knows they felt the new temple did not compare to Solomon's temple see Solomon's temple was very elaborate estimates in today's prices value Solomon's temple between 30 and 200 
billion dollars. That's how much gold and silver and he ran the value of money down. He had so much gold and silver in the kingdom at that time. It affected the economy. Verse 4. Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, do not fear. The Lord encourages the people to be strong and work. The Lord assures them of his presence. See, God's presence is more valuable than any amount of money. See, some people desire the presence of the Lord, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, -E -E presence, material resources, more than the presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E, of the Lord. See, if you have the presence of the Lord, you have everything you need. So, why, why is it important that, that God is saying, I'm with you, and that, that his presence is with you? See, God is omnipresent. That I means he's everywhere all the time. But see, there's a difference between being in the same room with someone and having their one-on-one -on -one attention. See, God is referring to his relational presence. See, a parent of an elementary student, they can walk into elementary school and, and though they're in the building with a lot of kids, their actual children is going to have a different interaction and a different relationship with that parent because it's their child. They have that relational presence. So God, he's, he's remaining faithful to the Mosaic Covenant. He's reminding them that I made a covenant with the people of Israel. He's but what's, what's going to help us understand this prophetic word that the Lord is giving them is that we see God referring to Israel as if they were at the Exodus. Look, look verse 5, he says, according to the word that I covenant with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. See, he's starting to refer to them Israel united throughout history. He's speaking to them as if they were at the Exodus, which in a sense they were through their ancestors. Hebrews chapter 7 talks about Levi paying tithes to Melchizedek through Abraham because Abraham is their descendant. See, God is not confined to time like we are. God exists outside of time and space. See, God's omnipresence is not restricted to geography, but it includes past, present, and future. He's there all at the same time. God assures the people of the presence of his spirit. Good news for us. Believers in Christ have the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul put in a question for him and said, don't you know that you the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? Don't you know that? Wow. Don't you know that? I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> don't you know that? Do you not know? <laughs> Verse 6 of Haggai 2, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, shake the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Hmm. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Mine, mine. <laughs> the Lord is speaking of the future victory. He's speaking of the end times. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26, gives us a clue to this. When the 
New Testament writer quotes this. He says, Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Mm. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, mm. as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Unshakable kingdom. Amen. The physical temple is merely a foreshadow of the end times messianic reality. Christ will return and manifest his glory in the earth. He will return and manifest the glory of God in the earth. Now, some translations, uh, they may translate verse 7 a little differently. When you talk about then they shall come to the desire of all nations, that may read different in some translations. But the reason why I'm convinced that that's talking about Christ uh, coming is because of Malachi has a similar statement. Malachi was a contemporary of Haggai and Zechariah. He's one of those post-exilic prophets. In Malachi 3.1, he says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you see will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Christ will return and manifest God's glory in the earth. See, uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 1 talks about, it describes Jesus as the brightness of God's glory. There's many, many layers to this prophetic word. See, it, it could be referring to when, when Jesus came and took on a human nature and he physically entered Herod's temple. In the first century, right? It could be Christ entering the millennial temple and the millennial kingdom. Many layers to this word. See, then he makes another reminder where he says, All the silver is mine and all the gold is mine, says the Lord, and all money belongs to God. And what we're going to see when we go back to Ezra is that God was getting ready to fund this project through their enemies. He was getting ready to turn their haters into their helpers. And see, it could have been that this lack of Solomon level wealth could have been the source of their discouragement. It could have been why they were feeling discouraged, but God had to remind them that money doesn't have to be in your bank account to fund his work. You don't have to write the check for it. It don't matter who account the money in, it's God's. You can hide it in the hole, lock it in the safe, it's his. And if he want to get to it, he will. <laughs> so stop looking at what you got in your account and boo-hooing about the check that you want to write that you can't. Because God will make sure the check get written. Amen. <laughs> Haggai chapter 2 verse 9. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. And see, he, he goes back and reminds them that, you know, the money is his. Don't be worried about the money. All of his minds. Then he jumps back to the future and talks about how the glory of the latter temple. Now the attention is placed back on the future. The glory of the latter temple will be greater than the glory of the formal temple. This could refer to the glory of Christ in the millennial temple and the glory of Christ in the new heaven and new earth. Quickly, Revelations 21, verse 22, the ultimate end time temple. Revelation 21, verse 22, he says, but I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. 
The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. That's what I'm looking forward to. That, I don't care if you could spend $50 trillion building something, and it's never going to be more glorious than the glory of God. Amen, somebody. Message number two, verses 10 through 14. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil, or any food, it will become holy. Then the priest answered and said, No. And Haggai said, If one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it become unclean? So the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Then Haggai, then, uh, then Haggai answered and said, so is this people and so is this nation before me, says the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Right. Message number two, Haggai is commanded to question the priest. Right. Essentially what he's saying is, can a garment that is made holy by touching holy meat make something it touches holy? In other words, is holiness transferable to a third party? The answer was no. Can a ceremonially unclean person transfer uncleanness by touch? The answer was yes. What does that mean, Pastor Bill? Just like diseases are contagious. If somebody has COVID or the flu, they quarantine. Why? Because if a healthy person goes near a sick person, they can get sick. Have you ever noticed that a doctor won't send a healthy person into a sick person's room and that health just transfers to the sick person, they become healthy? Yes. <laughs> but sickness can transfer, right? <laughs> but not health. <laughs> because health is not contagious. I wish I could just go up to somebody who's in good shape and just that transfer to me anyways. Um, <laughs> I, I can stop getting texts every day from somebody. <laughs> All right. So the people were living in disobedience to God's mission, right? So essentially what he was saying was the people were unclean. Why were they unclean? Because religious activity does not make you holy. Why doesn't it make you holy? Why doesn't going and offering the sacrifices, why doesn't going to church and listening to the pastor and giving money, why doesn't that make you holy? But what if I got perfect attendance in service? I've been faithfully attending for 15 years. Never missed a Sunday. Why doesn't that make you holy? Because their works were not mixed with faith. See, they were living in disobedience to God's mission. They wanted to build a comfortable life for themselves and engaged in structured religious rituals and have a nice religious social club where they can come and not be deal dealing with those type of people and all this kind of stuff and just live in my comfort. And I worked hard to get where I'm at and I just want peace and I don't want to be bothered. And their works were not mixed with faith. God had commanded them to build the temple and they fell into complacency and disobedience. Verse 15 through 17. So then he gives them two considerations. Consideration number one. And now carefully consider from this day forward. From before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days when one came to a heap of 20 ephahs, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw out 50 baths from the press, there were but 20. I struck you with blight and mildew and hell and all the labors of your hands. Yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consideration number one. As long as the people were in disobedience, they would suffer loss. There is no productivity in disobedience. The lack of productivity did not provoke repentance. See, God was messing with their prosperity to provoke repentance. He started messing with their pockets. 
Remember in, uh, the last week we talked about how they was, you know, they was working on their own houses. They they doing good. They they you know making a little, getting promotions, getting a little raise, and you know I'm I'm build getting my house together. I gotta get my house in order. And was neglecting God's house. And God said, I'm going to mess with what you love. I'm going to mess with your pockets. That's right. That's right. That's right. Consideration number two, verses 18 and 19. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? This is a rhetorical question. As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this, this day, I will bless you. Consideration number two. They planted, but did not harvest. However, now that they were back on mission, God will bless. Once they got back on mission, God blessed. The law of Moses connected obedience to prosperity. God controls nature and they were living in an agricultural society. They lived off of agriculture and farmer, farming. So they were dependent on God to put the blessing on what they were doing. You ever notice how all the technology we have can't stop food from perishing? Something to think about. So once they got back on track and got back on mission with God, then they could experience his blessings. You will not receive the blessings of God if you're in disobedience. Uh, verses 20 through 23. Message number three. Haggai chapter 2 verse 20. And again... The word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheatiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. So Zerubbabel is in the line of David. He's in the genealogy of Jesus. So what God is doing is he's, first of all, giving another end time declaration of the victory of Christ. But remember, the Old Testament, there was a mystery, right? There was talk and, and messages about the Messiah, but the name Jesus was not yet revealed to them. So God would talk about Jesus in other ways. Christ will return and defeat the wicked nations and kingdoms of darkness. He's speaking prophetically over Zerubbabel as a type of Christ. The servant of the Lord is a messianic title. He's talking about a signet ring or a seal. It's an impression that kings use to certify documents. Jeremiah 22, 24, there was another king in the line of David who was in so much disobedient. God said, I'm going to remove you. Uh, I'm going to remove the signet ring from my hand, right? But then Zerubbabel, because he was in obedience to God, he was able to bring that line back in order with God's plan. And ultimately, it's just signifying a close relationship. I will make you as a signet and a seal. And then he talks about, I have chosen you. The chosen one is a common messianic title. We see that in Luke uh, when they're mocking Christ on the cross. They say, if you are the, the Messiah, the chosen one, right? They understood what that meant. So God is talking about the victory in Christ again that will come. Encouraging the people, encouraging Zerubbabel, encouraging the priests, encouraging those who were there that God was with them and that there was a greater plan and purpose for what they were doing. Amen? All right, back to Ezra. So now we got to see some of the encouragement that they received uh, from the prophets. 
call your attention to Ezra chapter 5, and let's look at verses 4. So our verses 3 through 5. At the, time, at the same time, Tetanai, the governor of the region beyond the river, and Shethar Bozani and their companions came to them and spoke thus to them, Who has commanded you to build this temple and finish this wall? Then accordingly we told them the names of the men who were constructing this building. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, so that they could not make them cease till the report could go to Darius. Then a written answer was returned concerning this matter. So the governor is asking about the project, but however, this time God did not allow the building project, project to cease. And so the governor had to go and inquire from King Darius before he could try to stop them, uh, as opposed to what had happened in the past. And so verses 6 through 17 is, is this letter that's sent. I'm not going to read all of that. You can, you can read it on your own. But essentially, they're basically saying, hey, we went and talked to uh, these Jewish people that are building, working on this temple. Um, and they told us that, you know, God told us to do this. And they said that Cyrus made a decree. And so they essentially asked King Darius to do the research to see if this decree was really made. And so you can read verse 6 through 17 uh, later, but I'm going to do a, a summary kind of paraphrase. So the governor sends a letter to King Darius asking for confirmation of Cyrus' decree. The temple building was progressing. The Jews declared that, hey, they said, we're a service of God. And then they basically summarized 1 Kings chapter 6 all the way up to Ezra 3 <laughs> in a couple of verses. <laughs> and this is essentially what they said. King Solomon built the original temple. But then the people provoked God to wrath over a period of 373 years. Solomon's temple was finished in 960 B.C. It was destroyed 587 B.C. People went into captivity. This shows us that God is slow to wrath. Slow to wrath. 373 years of dealing with mess before he put the hand, he put the smack hand down. God is slow to wrath. Then God used King Cyrus to end the captivity and rebuild the temple. Shesh Bazar was tasked with returning items to Jerusalem. We saw this in Ezra chapter 1 through 3. And rebuilding the temple. The foundation was laid, but the building was not yet complete. So chapter 5 ends, they say, um, and I'll read that last verse, 17. Um, says, now therefore, if it seems good to the king, let a search be made in the king's treasure house, which is there in Babylon, whether it is so that a decree was issued by King Cyrus to build this house of God at Jerusalem and let the king send us his pleasure concerning this matter. Okay, so then in uh, verses uh, one of chapter six, verses one through 12, Darius has a search made. Um, he does find the decree. Um, it says what the people, uh, it confirmed what the people had said, and then he issues his own decree concerning uh, the building of the temple. Again, I'm not going to read all of those verses, uh, but you can read verses uh, 1 through 12 of chapter 6, but I'm going to summarize and paraphrase. So King Darius had a search conducted for the decree. The scroll was found in Media, one of the palaces in Media. The scroll confirmed the story of the Jews. King Darius ordered the governor to leave the Jews alone, right? That reminds us of Acts chapter 5 when there was like uh, Gamaliel warned the Sanhedrin. He said, leave these apostles alone. You might find yourself fighting against God. That's right. That's right. So Darius told them, leave them alone. Let them do their work. The king then diverted tax money from their region to fund the project. The governor had to supply animals and other goods for the sacrifices. So not only did he supply money for the building, but he also supplied goods and served goods for the sacrifices. So you don't we have to worry about what's in our account. It all belongs to God. He's going to make sure he get to us Amen. to do what he wants us to do. Amen. The king wanted the Jews. Then the king like, hey, tell them to offer sacrifices and pray for me and my sons also. I need some prayer too. Pray for me, y'all. And if you study King Darius, he expanded the Persian Empire farther than any other, other kings before him. There were strict consequences 
for the people who entered the work, right? He put a warning out there, like, look, anybody messes up, I'm going to tear a beam out your house and hang you on it. <laughs> said, leave them people alone and let them do. So I don't know if he was reading the book of Daniel or something, but he was like, look, <laughs> I ain't playing, y'all. Like, y'all better leave them people alone. Uh, man, had me crazy running around for seven years eating grass. <laughs> there you go. God has a way of influencing people to use resources for his mission. King Darius invokes a request for divine protection upon the temple and orders the work to be completed diligently. Amen. Verses 13 through 18, again, to summarize, the governor, he obeys the king's orders. It names, uh, you know, some of the kings and, and things like that. I'm going to read through this real quick. I think I have time. The Tatanai governor of the region beyond the river, Shethar, Bozani, and their companions diligently did according to what King Darius had sent. So the elders of the Jews built, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. And they built and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel, and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia, now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of, king, of reign of King Darius. Then the children of Israel, the priests, and the Levites, and the rest of the descendants of the captivity celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. And they offered sacrifices at the dedication of this house of God, 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering, for all Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. They assigned the priests to their divisions and the Levites to their divisions over the service of God in Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. So the governor obeyed the orders. God used two prophets and three kings to complete the work. The temple was finished the last month of the year in 516 B.C., 23 years after the decree of Cyrus. The temple was dedicated with joy the greater the opposition, the greater the victory, and the greater the celebration and joy. I'm going to say that again. The greater the opposition, the greater the victory, the greater the celebration and joy. Now, thank God we don't have to make sin offerings and all that kind of stuff because the sin offerings were replaced by the sacrificial death of Christ. Right? They were just foreshadows of what Christ would do once for all time. Amen. All right, let's close this out. Verses 19 through 22. And, and the descendants and the descendants of the captivity kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves. All of them were ritually clean, and they slaughtered the Passover lambs for all the descendants of the captivity, for their brethren, the priests, and for themselves. And the children of Israel, who had returned from captivity together, with all who had separated themselves from the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Amen. Passover is celebrated on the first, in the first month of the year. So the blood of the lamb... Back in the time of the Exodus, it caused the death angel to pass over the houses that were covered by the blood. And it was that Passover, that first Passover in Egypt that provoked the Exodus from Egypt. Pharaoh was like, get out, go. Yeah. <laughs> then it talks about these people who joined with the Jews to celebrate the pa Passover. It says, all the people who separated themselves from the filth, that sin, idolatry, spiritual uncleanness, they committed to holiness. You can't fellowship with God and demons. Can't have a foot in the devil's world and a foot in the kingdom of God. You have to separate yourself from the filth. What does holiness look like in your life? Mm. Then the passage ends with a reminder that God turned the hearts of kings to favor his mission. Right? Proverbs 21.1 talks about the king's heart is in the hand of God. And like a river, he can turn it any way he wants. 
God turned their haters into helpers. And I end with a couple verses. Genesis 50 verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. And then a New Testament verse. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who love God, to those who love God. Can't claim that verse if you don't love God. And to those who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. God's plan for the ages will come to pass. Not might, not maybe. It will. It's going to happen. Are you looking forward to the new heaven and new earth in which righteousness dwells? Or have you set your hopes on the temporary pleasures of this world? It's not going to last. Are you a helper? Diligently working in the harvest? Or a hater? Opposing the work of God through doubt, laziness, and apathy. Jesus said, whoever don't gather with me scatters. God commands all people everywhere to repent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will receive eternal life. Amen.